December 4th, only 150 men have answered Mackenzie's call. They are tired, famished, and poorly organized. Little Mac conducted himself like a crazy man all the time we're at Montgomery's. He went about storming and screaming like a lunatic. And many of us felt certain he was not in his right senses. Mackenzie's second in command is the surveyor and blacksmith Samuel Lount. They argue late into the night, unable to agree on a plan of attack. The next day, Mackenzie and Lout decide to act. Twenty militiamen, loyal to the British Crown, are waiting for them along Young Street. Colonel Lount and those in the front fired. Instead of stepping to one side to make room for those behind to fire, fell flat on their faces. The next rank did the same thing. Many of the country people, when they saw the riflemen falling down and heard the firing, they imagined that those that fell were killed by the enemy's fire and took to their heels. Stop! We can take the city! Where are you going? Come back! Stand your ground, man! Stand your ground! The city would have been ours. In an hour. Probably without firing a shot. <laughs> but 800 ran. And unfortunately, the wrong way. Two days later, a thousand militiamen and volunteers are issued arms and ammunition. They are ordered to oust the rebels from Montgomery's tavern. This time, it is Mackenzie's men who are waiting on Young Street. Half the rebels have firearms, the rest have only pikes and cudgels. is brief. The rebels drop their weapons and flee. Stand your ground! Stand your ground! Militiamen and volunteers ransack Montgomery's tavern and put it to the torch. Mackenzie, along with some of his comrades, makes his way to the United States. But others are not so lucky. Samuel Lump and Peter Matthews are hanged in front of the Toronto jail four months later. The rebellion in Upper Canada has lasted less than a week. In Lower Canada, armed rebels prepare for one last stand in the county of two mountains northwest of Montreal.
On December 14, 1837, General John Colburn himself leads an expedition to the village of Saint Eustache. Young Emily Berthelot watches his arrival. At 10 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday, a cold, clear, beautiful day, the English troops march down the King's Road, 1,500 strong. Infantry, artillery, cavalry, the officers in full dress regalia. The entire parade filed by at a leisurely pace with a kind of defiance. For most of the Patriot, resistance against such a force seems impossible. They retreat. leaders, Dr. Jean-Olivier Chenier, is determined to fight back. He and a few dozen men occupy the village church. General Colburn orders his artillery to fire on the Patriot stronghold. The siege is underway. Parish priest Jacques Paquin witnesses the cannonade. All the cannons began firing together, battering the church with astonishing rapidity. The masonry was extremely soft and resisted a tremendous number of cannonballs as they were fired off one after the other. The church holds out against the cannon fire for two hours. Dusk, General Colburn orders a detachment of the Royal Scots to dislodge the Patriot from their fortress at all costs. Among them, Lieutenant License. We got round to the back of the church and found a small door leading into the sacristy, which we battered in. We then turned to our left and went into the main body of the church. Here the rebels began firing down our heads. We could not get up to them, for the staircases were broken down. So Ormsby lighted a fire behind the altar and got his men out. Father Paquin recounts the last moments of the battle. Dr. Chenier saw that he could no longer defend himself from inside the church, for it had completely succumbed to the flames. He gathered up several of his men and jumped out of the windows with them. He was trying to escape, but he could not get out of the cemetery and was soon struck by a bullet and collapsed. He died almost immediately. 70 Patriot and three soldiers are dead. In the days following, soldiers and volunteers take revenge, terrorizing the county of Two Mountains. Some of the rebels try to make it to the American border, but hundreds are taken prisoner. Dr. Wolfred Nelson and the journalist Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville are among them. Exiled in the United States, Louis-Joseph Papineau writes to his wife, Julie. My dear, cherished wife, in my flight, I escaped so many and such close dangers, felt such tormenting anguish at the sight of the misfortunes of my country, my family, my friends. I sometimes think, in spite of the immense disasters suffered, that Providence will one day shine on us liberating our unfortunate country and uniting our family once again. 
when your litter arrived, telling us that our future is as uncertain as the prison. I was utterly disheartened. Now that martial law has been reinstated, and that the troops to be deployed throughout the countryside have arrived, I'm terribly afraid that we are to have our share of troubles, just as we had for a good part of the winter. spring of 1838, rebels and patriots tried desperately to rekindle the flame of the rebellion. They have formed a secret society known as the Hunter's Lodge and are recruiting members on both sides of the American border. They are waiting for the right moment to launch a new offensive. Papineau and Mackenzie are not part of the movement. They have renounced armed action. Meanwhile, a new governor general arrives in Quebec, charged with a delicate mission. John George Lambton, first Earl of Durham, is an aristocrat, liberal, and reformer. His orders are to investigate the causes of the rebellion. I beg you to consider me as a friend and arbitrator, ready at all times to listen to your wishes, complaints, and grievances, and fully determined to act with the strictest impartiality. Lord Durham's first task is to decide the fate of the Patriot languishing in prison. On Queen Victoria's coronation day, 150 prisoners are freed. In exchange, eight leaders plead guilty and are exiled to Bermuda. Wolfred Nelson prepares to leave the land of his birth. We belong to our country, and we will willingly sacrifice ourselves on the altar of her liberties. We have revolted neither against the person of Her Majesty, nor her government, but against a vicious colonial administration. Patriot leaders who have taken refuge in the United States are banished for life. In a letter to Queen Victoria, Lord Durham prides himself on having restored peace to the colony. Not one drop of blood has been shed. The guilty have received justice, the misguided mercy. But at the same time, security is afforded to the loyal and peaceable subjects of this hitherto distracted province. But Lord Durham's mission ends abruptly. Five months after arriving, he returns to England. The British government has accused him of exceeding his powers by sentencing the Patriot leaders to exile without trial. Little expected the reward I have received from home. Disavowal and condemnation. In these circumstances, I have no business here. My authority is gone. All that rests is military power. That can be better wielded by a soldier. And Sir John Colborne will no doubt do it efficiently. Lord Durham sails for England, a second rebellion breaks out in Lower Canada. The Hunter's Lodge attacks the manor house of the Seigneury of Beauharnois. 
Inside are the Seigneur's son, Edward Ellis, and his wife, Jane. She sees her captors as French revolutionaries.